now it's time, folks, to have a parade. Welcome to the 2016 World Press Freedom Index presentation. My name is Delphine Algon, and I'm the US Director of Reporters Without Borders. As you know, Reporters Without Borders is the world's largest press freedom organization in the world. We've now 30 years of experience. Thanks to our unique global network of 150 correspondents investigating in 130 countries, um, we are able to have a global impact by gathering and providing underground intelligence, defending and assisting news providers all around the world. The World Press Freedom Index that Reporters Without Borders published uh, every year since 2002 measured the level of freedom of information in 180 countries. It reflects the degree of freedom that journalists, news organizations and netizens enjoy in each country. Today, to discuss the 2016 index, I'm really honored and humbled to be seated next to such prominent woman journalists. Uh, Anna Day, an American award-winning independent journalist who earlier this year was detained in Bahrain. Arzu Gubalaeva, a journalist from Azerbaijan and currently a visiting scholar at Georgetown, George Washington University and Lili Yeko, an Ethiopian journalist and outspoken advocate for freedom of expression. Thank you so much, ladies, to be all here. And I have to say, it's such a great pleasure to have only a woman panel today. Um, thank you to all of us, to all of you, for being here today. And I would like to remind everybody that any information related to the 2016 World Press Freedom Index is under strict embargo until midnight. Uh, we will post the video of the press conference tomorrow, but no live tweet possible. And of course, uh, we will count on your professionalists to wait midnight to publish any information. It's because it's a worldwide launch, so we don't uh, have uh, it live right now. So Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index highlights the deterioration in freedom of information all over the world based on data collected in 2015. There has been a deep and disturbing decline in respect for media freedom. The many reasons for this decline in freedom of information include the increasingly authoritarian tendencies of governments in countries such as Turkey and Egypt, tighter government control of state-owned media, even in some European countries such as Poland, and security situations that have become more and more fraught in Libya and Burundi, for example, and that are completely disastrous, as in Yemen. All of the index indicators show a decline. This is especially the case for infrastructure. Some governments do not hesitate to suspend access to the internet, like in Kashmir, India, or even to destroy the premises, broadcast equipment, or printing presses of media outlet they dislike, like in Syria, in Yemen, Congo, or Mexico. The infrastructure indicator fell 16% from 2013 to 2016. But the legislative framework has registered an equally marked decline. 
Many laws have been adopted penalizing journalists on such spurious charges as insulting the president, blasphemy, or supporting terrorism. Growing self-censorship is a knocked-on effect on this alarming situation. This is an indicative of a climate of fear and tension combined with increasing control over newsroom by government and private sector interests. Every continent has seen its core decline. Europe has still the freest media, followed distantly by Africa, which for the first time overtook the Americas, a region where violence against journalists is continuously on the rise. Asia and Eastern Europe, Central Asia follow, while North Africa, Middle East is still the region where journalists are most subjected to constraint of every kind. Three North European countries hit the rankings, Finland, Netherlands, and Norway. The countries that rose most in the 2016 index include Tunisia, which is up 30 places, thanks to a decline in violence and legal proceeding, and Ukraine, where we observe a significant decline of violence, but of course, huge challenges remain. The countries that fell farthest include Poland, down 29, where the ultra-conservative government sees control of public media, and much further down, Tajikistan, which plunged 34 places to 150th as a result of the regime growing authoritarian. The Sultanate of Brunei, down 34th, suffered a similar fall because of the introduction of the Sharia and blasphemy charges have fooled self-censorship. Burundi fell 11 places because of the violence against journalists resulting from President Pierre Nkurunziza's contested re-election for a third term. The leading independent media were destroyed and more than 100 journalists fled abroad. Unfortunately, the same Infernal trio remain in the last three positions of the index, Turkmenistan, North Korea, and Eritrea. Let's now focus on the different region. In Africa, the biggest deterioration was seen in South Sudan, which fell 15 places. In this country, torn by civil war since 2013, Journalists fell victim to the conflict violence and a campaign of intimidation by the authorities. Countries with political crisis fell in the ranking, like Republic of Congo, Uganda, Djibouti, where the presidential desire to hold on power led to violence and censorship. A collapse of the rule of law and an increase in violence in certain regions account for the decline in countries such as Nigeria, where journalists are threatened by Boko Haram members, but also state agents. Freedom of information is just completely abolished in Eritrea, which is, again, the last country in our World Press Freedom Index. But Namibia <laughs> was Africa's best run country at the 17th place. Its constitution guarantees media freedom, its journalists are safe, its media landscape is diverse and no restrictions are placed on the internet. Now let's turn to the Middle East. The Middle East and North Africa continue to be one of the world's most difficult and dangerous regions for journalists. Between terrorism and abusive counterterrorism, where was the room for independent journalism? The subjects that are off limits, like ruling families or religion, blasphemy and apostasy, the list of obstacles to media freedom kept on getting longer and longer. In open conflict zones, combatants try to create black holes for reporting, as it has been the case in the past four years, um, the situation was worse in Syria, which saw the most appealing and sometimes barbaric abuses. Practicing journalism required enormous courage am amid the growing impunity and acute political crisis in countries such as Iraq, Libya, and Yemen. In countries at peace, or so-called at peace, often a police state, 
piece, Journalism, Journalism was stifled by leaders seeking to maintain stability. This was the case in Egypt, in Bahrain, in Iran. In Iran, the regime continued to imprison journalists and harass the media, even if Jason Rezaian was released earlier this year. Dozens of Iranian journalists remained behind bars. The media landscape darkened in Algeria, down 10 places. With the forced closure of TV station, Kuwait, down 13 with the adoption of a cyber crime law, and Jordan, where an anti-terrorism law was used to gag the media. But again, I'd like to finish each region with uh, the, a little of light and hope with Tunisia. Tunisia is up 30 places. Tunisia was the only country in the Arab Muslim world to experience significant progress in 2015. Many challenges remain in Tunisia, but a successful transition to democracy has facilitated media reform initiatives in the past five years. Now let's turn to the Americas. So overall, we observed that media freedom declined in the Americas in 2015 because of mounting political tension in many countries, fueled by economic recession and uncertainty about the future. The main obstacle to media freedom came from institutional violence, as in Venezuela and Ecuador, from organized crime, as in Honduras, from corruption, as in Brazil, and from concentrated media ownership, as in Argentina. Colombia and most of Central America suffer from organized crime, including cartels, paramilitary groups, and drug traffickers. <coughs> Investigative reporting is dangerous or impossible in these countries because of the determination of these groups and the level of violence, which includes beheadings. Mexico saw many murders of journalists that were linked to corruption and tra trafficking. The region's biggest fall was by El Salvador, which plunged 13 places. In this small Central American country, dogged by cartel violence, media freedom has declined steadily since 2014. And the election that year of President Salvador Sanchez Terren who has accused the media of waging a psychological terror campaign against his government. The state often has a tight grip on the media in Latin America. In Panama, which fell eight places, access to information remained part, partly under state control, and coverage of sensitive subjects, such as corruption, led to defamation proceedings. The region's two biggest media freedom violators continue to be Venezuela, where opposition and independent media struggled survive in the face of President Maduro, in, and of course, way below the others, Cuba, at the 171st position out of 180 countries, where Raul Castro's regime maintained its almost total control over news and information. And again, Let's finish by maybe the best country in regard of press freedom in the Americas, Costa Rica. Costa Rica, up 10 position, was yet again the region's leader, and this year even entered the world's top 10. Its, leg its legislation is very favorable for the media. It accords journalists a proper recognition. Jamaica and Canada were the region's other leaders. Although Canada fell 10 places because uh, the media freedom suffered a great deal under Prime Minister Stephen Harper's administration. So, because I'm sure you're all curious a little bit more about the United States, I wanted to stop a little longer on this. So the United States ranking improved in Reporters Without Borders WordPress Freedom Index at the 49th place in 2015, the country now ranks at the 41st out of 180 countries. This improvement is, however, quite relative. As in this section of the index surrounding countries, scores are close and small improvement are enough to drive such a position evolution. This relative improvement, by comparison, hides overall negative and concerning trends. <coughs> 
But now the United States now ranks higher than France, and I thought that with my accent I had to highlight that, but still ranks much lower than Canada. After, so let's start with the good points, which explain this uh, improvement. After months of US government consultation, which included RSF, President Barack Obama met in June 2015 with former hostages and the families of US citizens held hostage abroad and unveiled a new hostage policy. RSF held the policy improvement, including provision for involving the families more and the possibility of negotiating with hostage taker. But RSF reminds the US authorities that they must continue to live up to expectation generated by the announcement. There is still one American journalist missing abroad. His name is Austin Tice. He's the last American journalist alive missing in Syria. And we are continuing to do everything we can to encourage the US administration to bring him safely home. Other good news. In January 2015, the Department of Justice stopped its harassment of New York Times journalist James Risen. The DOJ has had tried for years to force him to reveal his sources for the book he published on the CIA, State of War, and threaten jail time if he refused. Another good news which explains this jump. All journalism-related charges in the case against former um, Vanity Fair journalist and now the Intercept contributor Barrett Brown were dropped in March 2014. So Barrett Brown is no longer in jail for his activity as a journalist. But the main cause for concern for RSF continues to be the current administration obsessive control of information which manifests itself through the war on whistleblowers and journalist sources, as well as the lack of government transparency, which reporters have continually criticized. The Obama administration has prosecuted more whistleblower under the Espionage Act than all previous administration combined. Jeffrey Sterling, a former CIA operative, was convicted solely on the basis of metadata in January 2015 for disclosing classified information to James Risen. Jeffrey Sterling is now in jail. He was sentenced to free and half year. The US presidential election has also been cause for concern for many reasons, not only for press freedom. But since the primaries began last summer, journalists have seen their access to campaign events regularly restricted by candidates from both political parties and have been insulted or even bullied on social media. RSF is also still troubled by many arrests of journalists during Black Lives Matter protests in Baltimore or Minneapolis. So there's still some room for improvement in the country of the First Amendment. To continue our world tour, if I may, Let's now focus on Asia. So the media freedom situation worsened significantly or stagnated in most of the Asia Pacific region. The decline affected Eastern Asia's democracy previously regarded as regional model. In the year since the law on the protection of specially designated secrets took effect in Japan in December 2014, many media outlets, included state-owned ones, succumb to self-censorship, especially vis-a-vis -vis the prime minister and surrendered their independence. In South Korea, relations between the media and government have become much more fraught under President Park geun -hye. In Hong Kong, where Chinese businessmen are increasingly interested in acquiring media outlets, media independence continue to be the main challenge for freedom of information. In China, the Communist Party took repression to new heights. Journalists were spared nothing, not even abduction, televised forced confession, and threats to relatives. In a recent tour of the country's leading news organization, President Xi Jinping said, the media must love the party, protect the party, and closely align themselves with the party leadership in thoughts, politics, and action. 
could not have made his totalitarian view of the media role any clearer. After improving last year, Burma and Philippines saw their scores decline in the 2016 index, revealing the limits of the reform and measure taken to improve media freedom and safety. But Sri Lanka is the Asian country that rose most in the 2016 index. Its journalists no longer had to fear telephone threats or enforced disappearance. Let's now move to um, the post-Soviet states, the Eastern uh, European countries. Media freedom has declined steadily in the post-Soviet states. Nearly two-thirds of the region's countries are ranked around 150th or lower in the index, and their score keep on falling. The fact that Russia improved its ranking slightly should not raise hopes because its score fell as a result of the persecution of critics, which has reached levels not seen for decades. And Russia's behavior has legitimized the growing repression throughout the region because Moscow acts as a regional model Beset by economic and security threats, the region authoritarian regime seemed to know only one response, tightening the screw. Although their crackdown just fueled more tension. In Tajikistan, down 34 places, which fell further in the index, President Emomali Hamon used counterterrorism as grounds for gagging critics and cons consolidating his personal power, and in so, doing jeopardize the fragile national consensus. Brandishing imaginary threats and the resulting need for stability to justify holding on to power is the favorite pastime of the eternal despots in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and Belarus. The regional economic crisis, the shockwave from the Ukrainian revolution, and in some cases, the uncertainty surrounding an approaching succession provided further grist to their mill. Not content with having long suppressed all expression of discontent, these regimes tightened their grip on internet users and hounded the few remaining independent journalists. After plummeting in the 2016 index because of the Maidan crackdown and the fighting in the East, Ukraine has jumped 22 places in the latest index, thanks to a significant decline in violence and to some long-awaited reforms. But major, major challenges remain, starting with the oligarchs' grip on the media and the information war with Russia. There was little change in the four regional countries that continue to be ranked best, Georgia, Armenia, Moldova, and Kyrgyzstan. Aside from the disparities in the situation of each of these four countries, media polarization and the lack of media independence are major challenges that are all shared. And finally, Turkey, located on its southwestern edge, Turkey suffered the region's second biggest fall in score because of the turmoil resulting from Syria conflict and the resumption of fighting with the PKK Kurdish rebels. President Erdogan's growing author authoritarianism and the paranoia displayed by the authorities just deepened the fault line in an already polarized society. And finally, Europe. The past year seems to have confirmed the trend seen in 2015 index a progressive erosion of the European model. Counter-espionage and counter-terrorist measures were misused. Laws were passed allowing mass surveillance. Conflicts of interest increased. Authorities tightened their grip on state media and sometimes privately owned media as well. All in all, the continent that respects media freedom most seemed to be on a downhill course. Poland, fell spectacularly in the 2016 index as a result of the government's declared aim of restoring foreign-owned Polish media to Polish ownership and, and a law enacted in early 2016 allowing the government to hire or fire those who run Poland's public radio and television. In Hungary, the government controlled a media council tasked with ensuring respect 
for public decency and human dignity as well as defining them. Media ownership by conglomerates with a wide range of business interests has long posed a threat to journalistic independence. But the threat is growing and is endangering the European model. This is especially the case in France, where most of the private sector national media are now owned by a handful of businessmen with interest in areas of the economy completely unrelated to the media. In Bulgaria, which has the European Union's lowest ranking, politician and interest groups control most of the media. In Macedonia, selective allocation of state advertising was used to control and gag the media. In the UK, the police used the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, RIPA, to violate the confidentiality of journalist sources while the number of police raids with the same objective increase in Italy, a country where threats from the mafia are still frequent. Physical violence was reported in Croatia and Serbia, where journalists were taken hostage or were the targets of petrol bombs. Some of the threats to journalists were directly linked to rising nationalism, such as the death threats in Sweden, and the physical attacks during anti-Muslim demonstration in Germany. And finally, it was in Paris that the attack on Charlie Hebdo took place on January 7, 2015, an attack mastermind from Yemen. So Europe was also the victim of the world's demons. I apologize for this very long overview, but as you can see, it's hard to sum up the uh, situation in 180 countries. But now I'm really glad to turn on to my panelists, <laughs> to our panelists today, to go maybe a little more deeper in some of this uh, country situation. So uh, first, Anna, thank you so much for being here. Uh, as I said, you are an American award-winning uh, independent journalist. And earlier this year, you and three members of your crew were detained in Bahrain. Bahrain has been ranked at the bottom of the World Press Freedom Index for many years and is now at 162nd position out of 180 countries. Ruled with an iron hand by the Khalifa royal family, Bahrain is notorious for jailing many journalists. Fear that the regime could be overthrown led to an increase in the persecution and censorship of dissidents since 2011, especially after the uprising by the Shia opposition in the east of the country. Convicted on such charges as participating in demonstration, property destruction, and supporting terrorism, journalists are given long jail terms or even sometimes life sentences. Many have been mistreated in detention, and some have been stripped of their citizenship. So can you tell us how your own experience there, your, your detention, is revealing of the overall situation in Bahrain? Thank you. My team was held for less than 72 hours. And while we were mistreated, um, I think the um, best thing that I can illustrate to you today is um, how differently we were treated because we were American journalists. Uh, on the day that we were detained, we were apprehended with Mazen Mahdi. He is a photojournalist in Bahrain who, like us, freelances for many international clients. When he was arrested, he was uh, not on the day of, of our arrest, but when he was previously arrested, he was um, beaten, and he continues to work uh, under the threat of constant monitoring and surveillance um, and uh, random and... Uh, I guess, unattributed threats that he receives daily for his work. Uh, we were also uh, detained by the same police who detained my colleague Naziha Saihed, who, who, like me, is a television reporter who works for international clients around the world. Uh, unlike me and my team, when she was arrested, she was beaten with a hose pipe. She was kicked, punched. Her head was shoved in a toilet. Another officer poured urine on her face. To this day, her torturers walk free. Um, we were also detained in the same police facilities um, that resulted in the murder of our journalist colleagues in 2011. In 2011, 
uh, Abdul Karim uh, Al Fakawi, a journalist from the only independent newspaper in in Bahrain, um, was arrested and detained. Also, uh, Zakaria Rashid Hassan Al Ashiri was also arrested and detained. Um, their bodies uh, were they died in custody. Um, they According to Bahraini authorities, they died of sickle cell anemia and uh, kidney failure, respectively. However, when their bodies were released, they uh, in showed signs of torture and mutilation. Um, so this was the context um, in which uh, Bahraini reporters uh, work and a context and threats that we likely never faced as US passport holders, um, but certainly understood um, when we were in these contexts uh, the, the difference in, in treatment. Um, since our arrest in February, um, there have been arrests of human rights defenders and journalists nearly weekly, um, arrests and sentences um, primarily based on uh, what we see as violations of freedom of expression. Uh, so that's the current context uh, in Bahrain um, and, and the seriousness and gravity that uh, our colleagues that work there around the clock face, um, and of course why we as uh, journalists from the United States, one of Bahrain's uh, most important allies in the world, uh, were reporting in Bahrain in February. What were you covering when you were arrested? And why were you arrested? We were working um, on uh, covering uh, a, a series. We're actually looking at how US foreign policy affects young people in the Middle East. Bahrain's a very important story because it's a country that's often overlooked. Um, it's one of America's most important allies, not only in the region, but around the world. It's home to America's Fifth Fleet. That's one of our most important military installations in the world. Uh, it's a refueling and operational base for 25 countries in, that include um, all the way from Afghanistan, Iraq, down to Somalia, um, really hot button places in terms of American national security. However, the abuses of the Al Khalifa regime of Bahrain um, make it very clear the compromi compromises, not only in terms of American values, but also violations of American um, uh, arms exports laws. Uh, that are happening in the name of American national security. So that's the story we were looking at covering. We were there um, for the five-year anniversary of their uprising. One thing many people don't know about Bahrain is that uh, while we didn't see it in the international news cycle the way we saw Tahrir Square in Egypt, actually Bahrain had the highest participation in their Arab Spring protests per capita of any Arab Spring country. Um, also, to this day, they have one of the highest per capita rates of political prisoners in the world. So we were looking at that disconnect when we were there on their five-year anniversary. Um, what we saw while reporting in these neighborhoods that um, have been cordoned off by, by the government, uh, young people who are hunted daily, some of them minors, um, by the government for participating in um, uh, political assembly, for demanding information about their friends and loved ones who have gone missing and have been disappeared. Uh, when we were in these neighborhoods, we saw an occupation, the likes of which I've only seen um, in the West Bank of Palestine under the Israeli occupation. So really a uh, very vicious and uh, disproportionate response to uh, freedom of assembly uh, issues that we, um, you know, see as uh, people's rights here in the United States, uh, but also under international law. So I will now uh, turn a little bit to Azerbaijan, but after um, we will uh, have a kind of maybe global conversation. Uh, Azu, thank you so much for being uh, with us to talk about the situation in your country, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is next to Bahrain in the World Press Freedom Index at the 163rd position. Let's let's smile about this ge geographic um, weirdness, but it's it's actually a pretty sad situation. Uh, not content with crushing all forms of pluralism, President Aliyev has been waging a relentless war against his remaining critics since 2014. Independent journalists and bloggers are thrown in prison if they do not first yield um, to harassments, beatings, blackmail, or bribes. Some independent media, such as Zerkalo and Azad League, have been stifled economically. Others, such as Radio Azad League, have been closed by force. In a bid to get the most recalcitrant 
or those who continue to resi resist in exile, such as Emin Mili and Ghani Mazahid, to submit. The authorities also arrest family members. And of course, one of the most famous Azeri journalists is still detained, Khadija Ismailova. So, Arzu, are you hopeful <laughs> that the situation can improve? Do you think um, the recent release we have seen is a real concrete sign of hope? Well, I think uh, we need to actually be um, logical about the recent release of political prisoners because in no way this should be um, seen as a sign of progress or reform. Um, it was obviously a bargaining as a result of long discussions and negotiations with the government of Azerbaijan um, ahead of uh, President Ilham Aliyev's visit to Washington, D.C. for the Nuclear and Security Summit. Um, now, the release of 14 political prisoners, of course, is good, but they should not have been there in the first place, and the remaining political prisoners should not be there, and they should be released. And of course, you mentioned Khadija Ismail. Um, uh, there's also Ilgar Mamadov. There are names of, of journalists and bloggers that are not often actually circulating in international media, and it's really important to um, continue um, advocating for their release. But in no way I see the release as a sign of hope. Um, the remaining, I, I feel that the remaining political prisoners, people like Khadija, people like Ilgar, are still in jail for additional diplomatic um, discussions or bargaining, um, as I do not um, see any honesty and commitment to reforms. And really, to see reform, to see hope, we need to start seeing legislative change, for instance, because a lot of these people who have been released, they can't go back to their usual jobs. Um, the legislation that's in place, both on um, NGOs, both on, on, on foreign funding, on media, prevents these people of going back to their original commitment, to their original focus in the country. And there needs to be uh, legislative reform, as I said. There needs to be genuine interest and sign that the government is interested. So sadly, uh, I'm not as hopeful. And there's still some independent information coming out of Azerbaijan or that the Azeri people can, can receive? Uh, well, yes. I'm extremely, extremely grateful to um, the journalists from the uh, Radio for Europe who continue reporting from the country despite the intimidation, despite the persecution. The day when um, RFE office was um, basically seized by the local police officers, even the cleaning lady was called into questioning. Um, and this just shows the ridiculousness of, of the uh, persecution that's taking place in the country. Uh, but these people, these brave journalists, they continue reporting. They're continuing um, going into the regions, going into people's homes, going into prisons, and reporting on, to the hearings, reporting on the cases um, and everything that's taking place there. And also, I would say there are also the staff, the freelancers of the Maidan TV, um, the dissident media outlet that's actually based out of Berlin, but they have uh, a team on the ground and they're continuing their reporting. And then there are, of course, um, independent journalists who are still working from the country and are doing an excellent job, either photojournalists or um, uh, online um, journalists. And I think their, well, their, um, the work that they do is quite, uh, quite remarkable. Uh, but in no way, again, you know, they're safe from persecution because what has happened in the country and what we've seen in the past few years, especially since 2014, is that so the journalists who uh, were able to leave, who did not have the travel ban, um, they, they left the country and so they're reporting. But then you have a significant number of people who are in the country who would like to leave but cannot leave because the government imposed travel ban as a result of an ongoing criminal investigation against journalists and against media outlets and against NGOs. Um, and it is really difficult uh, for them to continue reporting uh, because there's always a possibility of being beaten, arrested, um, kidnapped by the authorities, and tortured. Thank you, Arzu. Lily, thank you for being with us. Ethiopia is ranked at the 142nd position in the 2016 index after countries like South Sudan. 
Ever since the 2009 anti-terrorist law took effect, terrorism charges have been systematically used against journalists. The charges carry long jail sentences and allow the authorities to hold journalists without trial for extended periods. There has been little improvement since the purges that led to the closure of sick newspaper in 2014 and drove around 30 journalists into exile. Physical and verbal threats, arbitrary trials, and conviction are all used to silence the media. So, Lily, how many journalists are currently in jail in Ethiopia, and, and what are the other means um, of pressure that the government is using to silence the news providers? Um, thank you. Um, I'll start with the means of the pressures uh, the government uses to silence the media. Uh, so it's following the 2005 election uh, that the government started to blame the media for conspiring uh, with the opposition parties to overthrow the constitution. And since then, the government developed uh, this negative and very repressive outlook towards the media. Uh, fol following this election, mm, with direct government order and indirect pressure, uh, uh, more than half of uh, the um, newspapers that were once published in the capital city were closed down, uh, and at the time, 13 editors were sent to jail, and self-censorship became very common among those, uh, those the, uh, that continued publishing. And then in 2009, uh, the Ethiopian parliament passed the anti-terrorism bill, which is now being used to criminalize uh, non-violent dissent and any uh, various activities that should not be deemed as terrorism. Uh, the government also uses this anti-terrorism bill to uh, crack down against journalists and bloggers. Um, and uh, since its adoption in 2009, at least 25 journalists uh, have been charged with this um, anti-terrorism. Uh, in the beginning, the effect of this anti-terrorism bill was um, uh, limited to the written press since uh, uh, television and radio is closed for private ownership. Uh, however, this fast changed in the last four years since um, uh, social media uh, became, uh, people started uh, incre increasingly using social media in the country. And you probably already know the case of the Zone 9 bloggers who actively used social media and then uh, ended up getting charged with terrorism. Actually, there is also a new uh, uh, draft law uh, coming to the parliament. It's called the uh, computer crime law. And this law actually uh, criminalizes the posting videos and pictures which the government labels as uh, violent. Uh, so currently, there are about 12 uh, journalists, uh, bloggers, and social media activists that are either uh, that are in prison, either charged or convicted uh, with terrorism. Eskender Naga, who you, I guess maybe uh, most of you know, uh, uh, an outspoken journalist and blogger, is sentenced to 18 years uh, uh, in 2012 and is still in prison. And another fellow journalist, Wubusha Taye, is also uh, sentenced to 14 years. And there are uh, these are just few to mention. So these legal restrictions and repressions uh, are just an addition to uh, the long uh, standing tactic to economically weaken independent media. As I said, the broadcast media in Ethiopia is under state control, so leaving only pr the print media to provide independent news. However, publishers have been um, facing a very expensive office rent uh, high uh, printing fees that are uh, increasing due to double taxation on paper and ink. So um, this, uh, this makes it hard for publishers to uh, expand their circulation beyond the capital city. So that means um, uh, most people uh, are never exposed to independent media and get their news entirely from the uh, uh, government controlled radio and television station. Uh, in, if somehow the independent media manage to expand their circulation and get uh, popularity, they automatically uh, become um, under the government threat. Thank you very much for this detailed um, portrait. Um, it's maybe now a question for all of you. Of course, Ethiopia 
Azerbaijan and Bahrain are close allies of the U.S. and depend on the U.S. in a sense on many aspects. Or So what do you think the U.S. C can do to improve the situation of for journalists in these countries? Should do, can do. Well, I can start with Bahrain. Uh, one of the big points that we were highlighting is a timeline about uh, weapons transfers to the country. And after human rights violations um, happened around the early uprising in 2011, um, there was active lobbying not only from the Bahrainis, but also from our US State Department and allies in the Pentagon, um, essentially insisting on following the laws that we have that are on the books. We have laws in the United States that prohibit the transfer of weapons to countries that are not only in violation of international law, but in violation of American law. Um, the abuses that we see in Bahrain are undoubtedly in violation and contradictory to these values and to these laws. Um, so there was actually a halt of weapons transfers for a period um, that did force the government into, go, into going into a negotiation about reform. And a, a timeline was put forward uh, and uh, outlined that uh, that uh, promoted a pathway to, to better reform in the country. Of the 26 recommendations, only four of them have been implemented, yet our weapons transfers resumed um, despite the lack of implementation. Uh, so I do think, uh, whether it be Bahrain or other countries, um, particularly in the region, as we've seen what, uh, record arms sales uh, to the region and under President Obama, uh, a very easy, uh, solution would be um, asking our administration to follow uh, American, America's existing laws. Well, um, in case of Azerbaijan, uh, I would say one of the key um, asks is to make sure that the, the administration here demands the government of Azerbaijan to actually fulfill its responsibilities and commitments under the treaties that it's been part of, um, the international treaties, including the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative that, that does call for transparency, accountability, for, um, uh, for the cooperation with the NGOs. Um, I think what needs also uh, be done is to actually, I, uh, the, the, the priority for in relations with Azerbaijan and America is strategic interest, of course, and then comes this, the, the energy interest, and then comes the democracy and human rights. And I think um, within, within the administration here, there needs to be, a, to this point, a, by now, uh, an understanding that you cannot have um, strategic uh, interests and partnerships with a country where you have your human rights partners, your partners who work on democracy and, and uh, advocacy issues in jail uh, and see this constant revolving door policy that takes place. And also, I mean, the, the push for release of political prisoners has been uh, very recent, and I think there needs to be more push in terms of um, in, not just encouraging, but really asking to change the legislation because you know defamation is still criminalized. You have, it, and now it extends to online content. You have uh, laws that are strictly forbidding and restricting really um, the activity and existence um, of of any kind of activity. And this needs to also be uh, mentioned. And and really, the myth about Azerbaijan's importance uh, needs to be dem demystified um, at this point. Lili? Um, yes, thank you. First of all, I believe um, uh, change should come within us, and um, we Ethiopians are responsible for the kind of change we'd like to see. But at the same time, um, I also believe international pressure helps. Um, and uh, I've seen that working in so many cases, like for the Zone 9 bloggers I mentioned, uh, the international pressure and the uh, continued advocacy and campaign um, help it in the release uh, after a year and a half. Uh, I've been uh, 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 on a fellowship program with the National Endowment for Democracy where, where I have been researching on this particular issue and uh, uh, during uh, my fellowship there, I had a chance to closely observe uh, the engagement of the international community and uh, donor countries with uh, what's going on in Ethiopia. And one thing I realized is that the fact that uh, Ethiopia has a strong and better uh, security in the region, uh, has made most of these donor countries, including the United States, um, be soft with their engagement uh, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, yes, Ethiopia has a long uh, tradition of uh, security state, 
and it's heavily invested on. But at the same time, um, this shouldn't cloud the judgment of uh, countries like the United States and other donor countries um, in, in allowing the government to continue repressing human rights, uh, democracy, and freedom of expression. Um, to mention, like, uh, look what's happening in the country right now. There is a big drought, which is likely to, to change into famine. But how many local uh, media or independent media are allowed to go to these drought-prone uh, areas and cover the issue? There has been uh, a protest by the uh, Oromia region, which caused the uh, days of more than 400 people. How many local reporters were able to move in and out of those uh, areas uh, and cover the demands of the protesters? And recently, there, has, there was a killing of um, the Gambela people on the border uh, by the, a tribe from South Sudan. But how did that happen? And who is it to be blamed? There is no independent voice that goes to the area, investigate the situation, and hold um, anyone accountable. And this is all because of lack of um, any space for media or civil society. So um, Ethiopia needs uh, these countries, um, that this donor, US or other donor countries. Ethiopia needs uh, these countries as much as they need her. So I, uh, they should create a balance um, to equally and publicly say that Ethiopia is a repressive country and they need to start opening space for civil society, for media, and um, uh, to, uh, to press them on uh, to change uh, legislations. Journalists, bloggers, um, social media activists, political activists, um, protesters, and families of those who are losing, uh, families of those who lost their lives in these protests. And, all citizens in general need to see the U.S. speaking, demanding, and pressuring uh, on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's really important to highlight that, yes, change has to come from uh, within, from the interior. I, it makes me think that it's maybe also important to think of the media and the journalists themselves, and uh, that's where I turn to, to Anna. Um, actually, we met through um, your work with um, the Frontline Freelance Register and your involvement in what is called now ACOS, which is a culture of safety, a coalition of media and our press freedom organization who starts working together in order to improve the safety practices of Western freelancers and local journalists and um, in all around the world. And many positive steps have been achieved in the last year um, on this issue, like the adoption of safety guidelines by dozens of major US media, but also European media, Asian media, Latin American media, and so on. But on the ground, actually last year, at least 67 journalists were killed while reporting. 54 journalists were held hostage uh, in Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen. M most of them were local journalists. Uh, there are still 150 journalists in jail right now. Even you, <laughs> you were arrested. I mean, by s even you, I say that because you had the best training available for freelance independent journalists. You are aware of all the best practices possible. Uh, you are a very cautious <laughs> person. So what can be done to improve the safety of journalists on the ground? What journalists should do by themselves? What media should do? Well. To just give a little context, uh, the Frontline Freelance Register was established in 2012. It's um, the only representative body uh, organized by conflict frontline freelance journalists uh, for conflict journalists, uh, freelance journalists. Um, and this was coming out of, uh, it was really born out of tragedy. Um, it came off of the year where uh, uh, very famous uh, freelance journalists were, were killed in, in Libya and then in uh, Syria, we saw the abduction of uh, freelance journalists, including our colleague Austin Tice, who remains in captivity, but also our colleague uh, Jim Foley. Uh, so uh, really, it was born um, out of tragedy and necessity, uh, because as we saw the industry uh, shrinking and having less capacity to support 
uh, international news coverage. We saw the, the burden, responsibility, and privilege of international reporting um, uh, going on or being handed off to freelancers. Uh, so we wanted to professionalize the relationship uh, and uh, you know, ensure not only that uh, we were self-policing and weeding out uh, the war tourists and, uh, you know, crazy people that call themselves freelance journalists, but more importantly, that we were um, demanding that the industry um, extend professional safety standards to um, our colleagues uh, who, who risk so much in the field. Uh, so um, that's how Frontline Freelance Register was born, and we were, you know, very grateful that, you um, uh, you know, our allies in the safety space, whether it be Reporters Without Borders, uh, Frontline Club, uh, Brory Peck Trust, uh, Community Protect Journalists have always been allies in this, uh, but we were delighted to have uh, industry participation over the past year and the establishment of these safety principles that not only um, hold journalists in the field responsible for certain professional ad adherence to certain professional standards, but also uh, hold uh, companies responsible for uh, safety and professional standards that were previously extended to staffers that are not currently extended to freelancers and starting to uh, chip away at that uh, gap that currently exists. Uh, for me as a freelancer, um, this process is immensely important and has uh, changed my professional uh, my professional safety standards. Um, I had worked for years inside Syria, Gaza, Libya, other frontline uh, contexts without hostile environment training, with only mentorship from veteran journalists uh, and uh, with very little support. Uh, so when uh, I had asked on many different occasions for a hostile environment training to be provided by one of the many clients that I uh, string for regularly, and on every occasion it was uh, said at that point they didn't have the resources as, uh, to extend that kind of training for me. After these industry players signed this safety principle, myself and my team were able to point to these uh, safety principles, say, okay, to, to a certain client, okay, well, now you're a signatory to these principles, and we're, you know, shooting in a hostile environment in, a, in the coming month. Uh, you know, can you, can you pay for this training? Um, and because of the safety principles, for the first time they did take that responsibility and we were able to lobby for ourselves. So I think in terms of uh, freelance safety, that's a huge step now that we have these industry partners so that freelancers can empower themselves, whether freelancers or local journalists pointing when they're working with these clients, pointing to these safety standards and holding the industry accountable to the, um, to the standards that they've signed. This training was immensely important in terms of our security in Bahrain, um, in terms of uh, preparing uh, and uh, particularly securing our sources who would have been um, left in a very vulnerable position had our online and digital security not been, uh, not been uh, as very tight uh, and, uh, and yeah, could have resulted in far worse consequences for them while we exited on an embassy uh, embassy uh, plane. So uh, so that's kind of the context about Frontline Freelance Register, but things in the field, um, I guess we have a lot of threats in the field that are only getting worse. Um, and uh, while we have these safety standards and finally partners in the industry, um, I do still hold uh, governments accountable. There's so much more that can be done to uh, hold uh, partners and relationships um, uh, responsible for violations of press freedom around the world. Um, this has to be a priority for governments in negotiations. It's uh, not simply a humanitarian demand. It's a national security demand. If we're talking about long-term sustainable security, civil society and journalists play a role in that in creating healthy societies. Um, then the last thing I would say is, is the threat from within we also face within our industry. Uh, while again, we are very grateful to have this unprecedented process, some of the demands on the industry side have still not been met. That's uh, very alarming uh, to, to journalists who, you know, have since these, uh, this uh, process has been signed, have been reporting in Iraq and Syria and other places that are very dangerous. So from our perspective, if we are working very hard to save money and work with our partners um, at foundations to fund our own 
uh, hostile environment trainings and uh, professional preparation, we do need our industry partners to walk down the hall to their finance and legal departments, change their contracts, ensure that our expenses and payments are done on time and are in, or in advance. Um, so that's something that I still see as, as the threat from within uh, that we're calling it at uh, Frontline Freelance Register, but uh, something that can be done very easily. Arzu, Lili, do you, you want to comment on this aspect of how journalists, media can be part of this improvement? Well, I'll just echo what Anna said in terms of support network and mechanisms and holding um, the clients as well as the industry responsible, um, especially in light of the reporting um, the freelance uh, journalists do. And you know, I myself being um, also a freelance reporter, you often um, are in a situation where you do face the the danger, and I have not been arrested, luckily. Uh, but I have friends who've been in and out of jails across various countries in the world, and it's extremely, extremely important to have that backup, to have that support network, to have you know a list of people that you go to. Um, of course, you have your emergency contacts, but then um, you know internationally, who do you who do you who do you call uh, the moment that you know your friend has been arrested or held at the airport? And um, I think. This, this has become a major issue, and this needs to stay on the agenda and the government, uh, and should be discussed within, within the, on the government level as well. Uh, yes, um, in terms of, um, uh, it, within the context of Ethiopia, it is really um, difficult to demand so much of the media people, because it's a very, very restrictive environment, and uh, it would be unfair mm -hmm. uh, to blame them for um, so much. But at the same time, um, I should also say that media should be responsible. Um, uh, as much as it's important to cover political situations, it's also at the same time important to cover other economic and social issues. And um, uh, media need to div uh, diverse their, uh, their coverage. And also digital media is now a new platform, uh, even though it's not um, uh, still safe, uh, but still, uh, there is a big opportunity uh, uh, within uh, that new platform and uh, journalists should be able to use um, that new platform. And, uh, but at the same time, they should also be responsible in, what they, in how they use the, 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 the digital media. Uh, the, long tra uh, the traditional media um, has certain values um, that put for journalists on how they practice their journalism, but uh, the digital media uh, it leaves a very big room for journalists to exercise their profession the way they want to. So I should say I would say that uh, journalists need to uh, practice uh, being uh, accountable, and this is also where the international community might help as well in terms of uh, providing training uh, on the use of the dig technologies, uh, digital media, and um, uh, uh, this is one of the areas the international community can help us. Well, thank you very much, ladies. I will now open the floor to questions. Uh, first, I would like to apologize in advance because it would be certainly very hard for me to know everything about 180 countries, but I will do my best. And our expert researcher are available for phone interviews tomorrow if you need really specific details on a specific countries. And please introduce yourself and your media and ask uh, a short question. There's a Mike, yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Squitieri with the Overseas Press Club, Peter Mill Press Committee. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, in the past, sometimes you've been able to, and I can do, get this information tomorrow, but like in Iraq, for example, you were able to break out how the uh, press freedoms were in the Kurdistan region uh, of the country, you know, which has different press laws than the rest of Iraq. Well, information such as that for different countries be available tomorrow and, or in the near future? So I'm sorry, I will ask you to repeat. I didn't hear. Well, did you hear my question? <laughs> no, uh, I guess at the last. Uh, in the past, you all have been able to make available at some point, not necessarily today, um, information about certain parts of countries, such as the Kurdistan region of ah, Iraq. Okay. If that's going to be possible in the future, can I call in a day or two for a breakout in that? You can call any day. Yes. <laughs> and I had a question for, for okay. Lily. I just want to be clear of what I think I heard you say, that in, um, in Ethiopia, they're passing a new law regarding computer 
criminal law that makes it a crime to show violence on the computer. So in other words, uh, if I was filming a government force beating protesters and then put that on, I could be charged for showing violence, even though that violence was perpetrated by the same government that would charge me. I mean, this is a new draft law, which is going to the parliament for, um, uh, to come out as a law. But uh, the, the, the draft law, the way it's um, uh, stating, uh, posting videos and pictures, which the government thinks are violent, right. uh, it's the way you described it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and make sure it yes. wasn't too Orwellian. Yeah. <laughs> and to answer your first uh, question, um, so the WordPress Freedom Index is a ranking of 180 countries, but of course we continue to focus on different region of countries. So uh, really recently we published a, a report on Kurdistan that we can uh, of course uh, send you, which was very important and timely actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will publish very soon a report on Hong Kong. Uh -huh. So there's a uh, regular regional reports, if I okay, could say, but you. we can send you the recent ones. Hey, um, I'm Brian Harris. I'm with the Yomiri Shimbun, a Japanese newspaper. Um, so with regards to Japan, I don't know if you can tell me off the top of your head, but since the state secrets law was passed at the end of 2014, can you list any um, specific examples of um, how Japanese media have reported to self, uh, resorted to self-censorship? Um, and then I have a, a quick question for Anna, if you don't mind. Um, so in addition to Bahrain, you've obviously covered, um, you know, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Nusra, that sort of stuff. I know in some respects it's apples and oranges, but in general, in your experience, which has been more dangerous, covering like U.S. allied autocrats or terrorist organizations? Uh, Anna, start so I can re read my note on Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was happy when Delphine brought up that in, in the Middle East we're dealing with uh, terrorists and then abusive counterterrorism, I think is what, what she said, and that's uh, definitely what we see. We were in Egypt earlier this year where the number of political prisoners is um, at levels similar to North Korea. Uh, also, the number of journalists that remain in prison in Egypt um, is incredibly alarming. Uh, so we see this threat you know, in different contexts. Uh, what I think think in terms of uh, freelance journalists and, and maybe uh, what we're, we're most nervous about in the developments um, in terms of designated terrorist organizations is that, um, you know, it, it's unfortunately not the first time that um, hostage taking and, and executions have been used against journalists. However, uh, Previous, in previous generations, uh, journalists had sources that were in Al-Qaeda or some of these groups. and and uh, personal trust was developed, and uh, we were able to work with these designated terrorist organizations. Um, and part of that is because they, they needed us. They wanted to get their uh, message out to international media, and we were useful to them as well. That was the relationship. Uh, now with new media, uh, as we've seen with ISIS, they can broadcast their own media, and they've been incredibly strategic in doing so. Uh, so our concern right now in terms of the heightened risk with designated terrorist organizations is that have we become more useful um, as hostages than we are as messengers? And I think we have seen that in the past couple of years, particularly in Syria. So as uh, we mentioned before, Japan is now 72nd in our WordPress Freedom Index, and so it, which means that it's a fall of eight, 11 places. So as you know, uh, the Japanese media are really powerful, and they are free to cover whatever they want except state secrets. And what is especially concerning to us is the vague description of state secrets and these rather vague categories protected by a very harsh law that deters journalists from embarking um, on investigation. And the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the imperial family's personal lives, and the defense of Japan are all considered state secrets. So that has been our main uh, concern for, for the last year. If you want more and more details, I would recommend you to call uh, my colleague who is following Japan uh, uh, 
day, daily. And uh, his phone number is uh, at the end of our index, but I'm happy to put you in touch with him. Uh, my name is Eli Smith. I'm a fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, I find it a bit strange. For example, you said uh, the classification of the best, uh, uh, the best ranking um, in terms of ranking in Africa is Namibia. Mm -hmm. And then the Republic of Congo is 115, if I'm not wrong. Uh, may I know the type of the criteria in which you use to classify? Because in Congo, for example, the Republic of Congo, you don't have any freedom of speech. You may not have journalists in jail, but you have all kinds of intimidation going on. So, I mean, I want to like to, I would like to know the type of the criteria, the yes. how you did the classification. So, uh, to produce this uh, WordPress Freedom Index, we take into account qualitative and quantitative criteria. So, uh, we have actually a full-time statistician working on it. So, the quantitative criteria are the number of journalists arrested. Uh, threatened, attacked, forced to exile, and the period which was considered for this index are, is 2015. So that's the quantitative criteria. Uh, but more importantly, if I could say, are the qu qualitative criteria, uh, which are actually um, composed of 87 questions, which are sent to our uh, partners in each of these countries. So it, it could be journalists, lawyers, academics. And these uh, 87 uh, questions covers issue like uh, pluralism, self-censorship, level of self-censorship, legislative framework, infrastructures, and so on. And we ask our uh, partners and journalists uh, in each of these countries to answer these very precise questions. This question exists in 20 languages, so it's French, English, Spanish, Korean, um, Arabic, and so on. And then uh, when the people answer this question, then our statistician compiled all this data. You have actually this amazing um, uh, Equation, equation on the methodology that I don't understand, but um, <laughs> you're welcome to, to look at it. I, I trust uh, his uh, statistic skills. And that gives a score for it. So the combination of the quantitative and qualitative criteria give a score for each country, and the score then give a ranking. So that's how we establish um, this index since 2002. And of course, it, each, each country is completely unique, but it's a, we believe it's a, the most scientific way to g have an overview, a benchmark of the uh, world press freedom situation. Last question? Yes. It's she, My name is uh, Marius Mung. Uh, I'm from the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, mon anglais n'est pas très parfait, mais je peux comprendre. Uh, je peux poser ma question en français, si c'est possible à Delphine. I will Delphine. try to translate afterwards in English. Then. Thank you. Alors, vous avez parlé de, de, de la situation des journalistes au Congo. Et quand vous parlez du Congo, précisément de quel Congo il s'agit, il s'agit de la République démocratique du Congo ou de la République du Congo ou des deux Congo. <laughs> Combiné. Merci. So, um, our friend uh, Marius, uh, I'm sorry I didn't catch your last name, uh, asked uh, about which Congo I was talking about when I was referring, because of course there's the Rep uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and Congo Brazzaville. So, we uh, have analysis for both countries, of course, and if you want, I can tell you uh, a little bit of or main concerns for each country. So, by example, in um, Democratic Republic of Congo, freedom of information is constantly violated. Uh, the country is ruled by President uh, Joseph Kab Kabila since his father assassination in 2001. Journalists are exposed to threats, physical violence, arrests, prolonged detention, and even murder. And the main perpetrators, the army, the police and the security services enjoy complete impunity. And just to name one case, the Burundian journalist Egide Mero has been detained arbitrarily since October 2015. 
So that's maybe the main uh, concerns for the Democratic Republic of Congo. For Congo Brazzaville, um, so the country has been ruled for the past 30 years by Denis Sassou Nguesso, who has amended the constitution in order to be able to run for a third term. Congo Brazzaville seems to be a pluralistic country, but this is just a facade. There are a score of privately owned TV stations, a similar number of newspapers, and around 40 radio stations, but they are all under strong pressure to censor themselves, and many of them are owned by government allies. Since 2014, several journalists have been threatened, forced to flee the country, or summarily deported for criticizing the government or inviting opposition politicians to express their views. I don't know where is the mic, but... Uh, <laughs> Hi, my name is Daniel Mora, I am Italian. Uh, and the question is about Italy. Uh, do you think it's possible to stress uh, what's happening on the advertising market? Uh, resources are, have been cut off in the past few years. So in my impression, mafia is still a problem, but the big, big raising problem is that if I want to write something about Fiat Chrysler collapsing or not selling enough cars, no media probably in Italy will be able to fight against Fiat Chrysler press office and money. So thank you for raising this issue. Actually, the in, in economic independence of media becomes a huge issue all over the world. Uh, in Asia, in Latin America, in Europe, really. And it's something that we don't talk so much about because it's a much softer pressure mm. than a journalist put in jail, a journalist killed, attacked. But at the end, it's a much more dangerous and violent uh, violation of freedom of information. And uh, I have to say that that's why <laughs> Reporters Without Borders is launching a worldwide uh, investigation on the independence, economic independence of the media. Uh, we started in some uh, example countries like Cambodia, Tunisia, uh, and really we want to have deep uh, country level analysis. And I hope the first results will be published in the coming months. But the aim is because it's such a big need to investigate this issue, it will be a topic for the coming years. And just on Italy, I just want to highlight that I think it's still striking for many Americans or many Europeans or many citizens just to have in mind that uh, in Italy there are between 30 and 50 journalists under police protection because of their reporting on the mafia. So I, I think it's, it's important to remind that uh, press freedom is under attack in a very violent way in many countries in South Europe. Thank you. Uh, I'm Vivi Timojum from the Voice of America Turkish Division. So uh, yesterday or two days ago, German Chancellor Angela Merkel allowed the prosecution because of, uh, as you put it, the authoritarian regime in Turkey, Erdogan, uh, on a comedian because he was reading a poem about Erdogan. So uh, how do you, how do you uh, assess the situation? How do you use this information for this ranking, for example? So this um, latest uh, abuse of, um, in a very sad long list for Turkey, uh, is taking into account in what I call the quantitative criteria. So the number of abuses, the number of journalists arrested, threatened, attacked, the, the number of legal procedures launched. So of course, as in <laughs> Turkey, there's so many, so many, so many legal procedures uh, that affected directly the ranking of Turkey for many years. And we always believe it cannot be worse, but with Turkey, we always have uh, amazing surprise. <laughs> Uh, but actually, on Turkey, maybe Arzu, you want to, to say a word uh, because you were based in, in Istanbul for many years, so you, you have seen this um, development uh, on the. First well, point. I mean, yeah, it's I've 
since 2007, which is when I, I moved to Istanbul to work, and then I was back in Istanbul in 2010, I, and watching Turkish state of media freedom deteriorate and just fall further down um, on almost to the level of Azerbaijan is quite saddening because from Azerbaijani perspective, living in Turkey and interested in Turkish politics, Turkey has always been sort of this example of per perhaps more progressive uh, politics, media freedom, political freedom, and then seeing this country um, change so quickly, uh, so drastically, and 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 now you know you read an, an opinion piece in New York Times this morning about this very same topic and how um, Erdogan's oppression of media isn't just limited to Turkey; it is obviously uh, going over the borders yeah. and uh, to Germany, a country that uh, once strived and um, you know. As you said earlier about countries in Europe, you know these are the countries that actually push for freedom and were the um, the the source of of, of all this um, uh, freedom and, and struggle for freedom. Uh, so it's quite disappointing to see um, how, espe especially this case, because it's not just one case in uh, in terms of this humor political satire that was used in Germany. I mean, there was a a video, uh, a, a, a YouTube video uh, about uh, President Erdogan. Um, there was a song about President Erdogan, and that also backfired. In fact, the uh, the ambassador was called in um, to a meeting with with President Erdogan, and he was asked to make sure that YouTube removes the video. Uh, so it's 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 a number of cases, and it's becoming you don't know whether to laugh or cry uh, when you read these kind of news in the media. Yeah. Um, last questions. Thank you very much. My name is Nasser from Al Jazeera, and we have our share from all this, even killings. Uh, pushing the limits a little bit and beyond these numbers, uh, respecting also what you do in bringing the numbers and shedding the lights. In the end, aren't you facing just cultural issues? Look, Bahrain, Egypt, Laos, Namibia, or whatever. In the end, as media, we go in to cover story, cameramen, reporters, producers, anybody loses a job. Knowing the dangers, knowing the, the free word won't help you. Maybe Médecins Sans Frontières with the press release here and there on Al Jazeera International, and that's it. I met so many reporters who came back from dangerous zones who told me, we just regret doing it because nobody cares. Nobody cares. You got jailed in Bahrain? Really, nobody cares, and I'm sorry to say it, but I was told this by people who lived really much more dangerous situations that I was in. I did some Egypt, but I was not shot at. But, you know, the fear is enough to cripple you as a reporter. But in the end, and this is my question, and pushing, maybe pushing the limits to a racist level, isn't it a cultural issue? These countries are just like that. Do not, we, media, expect some civilized treatment, Bahrain or others. You see what I mean? Once we I, go, yeah, I, yes, I see what you mean. Because we, we travel internationally, we, we cross those barriers, maybe Ethiopia for me tomorrow, for me, for her, and we're not from there, knowing the kind of government there is there. It's not no secret. And okay, you're doing your job, but you, you kind of push the limits. You'll, you'll be in I, a number maybe on this sense on frontier tomorrow. So. I got your question. Yeah, so what, what, are, what is our responsibility also? Knowing that they are dictators. Okay, so, and the word accepts it. You okay. know, the UN didn't do much. Thank you. Uh, the, okay. So, and I think under you, this question, there was also like, is it worth it? People are still reading the news. I just want to say on the first aspect of your question, uh, is it cultural? And I, I think, as we say, uh, most of the journalists who are in jail stage covering the story, our local journalists, our Ethiopian journalists, our Syrian journalists, Iraqi journalists, Chinese bloggers, Vietnamese bloggers. It's not, it's in their, it's in the human blood to want to know the truth. So, and that's why the locals are always the first victims of the repression and the dictators. So I think that that would be my uh, answer, but I'm very curious to hear from more panelists what they think. Um, yeah, just, just to add a point to what you said, um, the, uh, when a foreigner journalist comes to Ethiopia and it gets in prison, and when a local journalist gets in prison, the attention they get, uh, the coverage they have,
uh, the pressure there is in the entire world is, is different. Like for example, there were two Swedish journalists who came to Ethiopia to cover uh, the, uh, the conflicts uh, between um, Ethiopia and the region. And uh, they were caught by the Ethiopian government and they were charged with terrorism and they were sentenced to 11 years in Ethiopia. But the amount of uh, coverage, the amount of um, screaming around the world <coughs> was um, uh, huge. And within two years, they were able to be released and go back to their countries. But the same Ethiopian journalist who was arrested the same time they were arrested and who was sentenced at the same time they were sentenced is still in prison, even though he did what they did, ask for pardon. So um, it's the local journalists who always will be uh, the victims, who will suffer most within their own government and within the, the, the law their own government applies on them. Uh, I guess in terms of our risk assessment, for example, we take this very real uh, difference in treatment into um, our, our risk assessment in terms of a risk profile. And and I would echo what my colleagues are saying that uh, that it's – I think that even some of our reporting is in an act of solidarity. I don't think it's cultural because I think I meet – wherever I go, I meet people in these different countries who've, you know, grown up in – totally different circumstances in me that still hold these values true. So um, to, you know, go to Bahrain where we know our risk profile is lower and we want to report on this because our colleagues are inside reporting on this daily and getting locked up, you know, that's part of, you know, what A, drives us to do this and is part of the risk assessment. Um, and then in terms of if, if people care about this, uh, you know, it's, uh, exhausting work. I think a lot of people who, you know, work in journalism uh, feel like it's falling on deaf ears all the time. But um, I guess I think I turn that scrutiny inwards and uh, think it is a, the responsibility of journalists to, to better journalism, to be always challenging ourselves creatively um, to to capture uh, the the empathy that I think all humans are capable of. Um, and you know maybe it's continuing working even harder uh, to to try to really uh, I guess galvanize and electrify people into action and awareness. And if I may add, um, I think in case of Azerbaijan, the problem is not that people don't read about it. It's just there's not much written about Azerbaijan's situation and what's happening there and the political uh, freedoms and how many people are in jail and how many journalists go to jail for their work. Um, so for me, it's not just a matter of solidarity. It's telling the stories of of those who who should not be in jail and, and making um, international audience actually aware uh, of, of this one small, tiny little country uh, where oppression is at its highest and where government can just do whatever it wants. Um, and yes, I know what's happening in the country, but to me it's a little more than just knowing. It's more telling and, and making sure that um, the stories are heard, even though they might not be read or not get so much attention. It is there uh, if someone looks for it, and it's important for, for, for information to be there when someone wants to look for it. Thank you so much for finishing on such a strong message. Thank you to all of you for being here today. And of course, a reminder, uh, the embargo is until midnight. And our Reporters Without Borders researcher are available for more specific interviews on countries. But we are also happy to answer uh, interview now. Thank you so much. <laughs>